So we've come to the post LFS configuration and extra software. Um, so this really is the point where I need to pause at the Beyond Linux from Scratch manual and go back to the um, I, the actual iMac machine and go and reboot into the um, host system that I use, the host Beyond Linux from Scratch system. In fact, it could be any live CD. What you need to be in, um, sure about is that that live CD has got um, Gparted because that's what I'll be using. If, you, if you're happy using Parted or um, is it G, G Disk, I think it is, to jiggle around, I don't I think you can use Parted and G Disk to do what going to do it's basically resizing the partition it's onerous to do it on the command prompt so that's why i'll be using the gnome partition editor gparted um, and therefore you need a graphical environment and therefore you know that means a, a live um, bootable uh, disc whether it's usb or cd or dvd so that's what i'll be doing um, one thing to bear in mind with the mac if you leave the usb plug in and you reboot you won't be getting uh, a clean boot because it jiggles all the assignments around the disk assignments if I show if I mount the uh, is it boot oh no is it one partition is it can't remember the configuration of this yeah, oh yeah it's already there um, if I show you the grub configuration file, you can see here, although there's only one single disk in there, the Apple Mac operating system has given it a designation of HD73. So um, I think if you recall from LFS, that was one of the things I had to track down is to find out what the designation was that the Mac gave it. Um, I presume it's the internal firmware that's maybe allocating other devices as a hard disk and that's what uh, causes Grub to I, I guess you could say get confused and think it's got six prior disks of that or seven prior disks um, so if you do leave the a USB in with a, a valid partition that Grub recognizes um, it, it would cause for example that HD7 to go to HD8 and it would mean that Grub wouldn't boot correctly so that's one thing to bear in mind when you reboot if you do leave a, a USB stick in with a partition on it. So having said that, what I'm going to do is to plug in the USB stick with the um, live OS that I'm going to boot into, which as I say is Endeavor OS, the same one as I use to reboot. Um, uh, sorry to build Linux from scratch. I'm going to reboot into that, and when that comes up, run gparted and get rid of the Apple partition and reallocate it for the Linux from scratch partition. So I'm going to come out of here, reboot, and if you remember, when the Apple reboots, when the screen goes blank and you get the chime that's the point that you want to press and hold down the alt button so the screen's gone blank listening for the chime there it is I've pressed the alt button I'm holding it in now this bit doesn't get captured on the uh, screen capture looks like I've missed the missed the alt button so let's try and reboot again Right, for some reason the control alt delete doesn't work in grub so I'm just going to have to power off and try again this is probably the worst bit of the Apple Mac for me is the trying to boot from other devices because there's no BIOS menu no UEFI menu right now it's not capturing that alt button that I'm pressing it um it's quite a pain to get the timing right of the alt button 
to get the boot menu up. Right, I think, yes, I've got it this time. Right, so I've got the two icons up. I've got one that's a picture of a hard disk saying, saying Mac holes underneath it. And I've got another which is a picture of an external hard disk, like a yellowy orange gold box with a green light on. And it says EFI boot. So I'm going to press enter. And I've got the Endeavoros menu, boot menu coming up. So hopefully very soon when the video um, card gets initialized, you should see the Endeavor OS come up on the capture screen. Right, the screen's still blank. Hopefully it should. Yep, there it comes. Now, if you remember, I've said that this is a solid state drive, so the reconfiguration of the partitions is going to be fairly quick. Um, if you're on a spinning disk, especially if it is... Uh, well, yes, yeah, sorry, it, is, it will be a laptop disk in this thing. Um, it was a, a, a small disk, so um, unless it's uh, some sort of specialist laptop drive, um, it will be quite slow because I think most, if not all, laptop drives run at 5400 RPM, which is a lot slower than a standard desktop drive, um, so it's going to be that much slower anyway. So that's something to bear in mind that this could take... Um, maybe an hour or two so let's see right now the mouse is not working I think it would it's a bit funny I might have to uh, see if I can sync it up again right yeah that's it right let me just get a bit of paper to put the mouse on. It's a bit old-fashioned, this mouse. Right, so um, I don't need this window, so I'll get rid of that. And what I want here, I, I'm not sure what... Oh, it is there. It's right on the first screen, so it's simple for me to put this up. So let's make this bigger. So you can see that we've got the fat drive. We don't want to touch that because that's got our boot for Linux from scratch on there. We've got the APFS partition, which is the Apple partition we want to get rid of. We've got an EXT4 partition, which is our Linux from scratch. And you can see that it's, you know, what's that? I don't know, 5% used or something. It's you know, partially filled in. Um, and we've got a Linux swap drive. I saw this was 8 gig. It's probably over the top to leave it at 8 gig. The machine's got 8 gig of memory. Um, even with four cores, it's unlikely we'd ever fill that up. But um, what I might just do is to maybe just to resize that to a round figure of 8.0 gig. Um, I would say probably 4 gigs plenty. Uh, to be quite honest. Um, all right, I'll need to get a network connection, won't I? If we're going to do anything in Linux from scratch. Um, so I'll do that afterwards. Um, so first thing I'm going to do is to right-click this, or you can right-click the graphic up here and do delete. Then I'm going to right-click this one and do resize. Now sometimes GPartay can get its knickers in a twist if you try and do too many things at once. So sometimes it's better, in fact I might do this. It's to do with the alignment and numbers and so on. It it, um, it could be rounding errors, it sort of failed, it comes back and says it's failed to do an operation sometimes. We think well there's no reason why it should have failed. So what I've found is sometimes better to do just one little action at a time. So if I uh, press this OK button or Start button just to delete that partition first. OK. Then what I'm going to do next is to... I'll resize this swap partition next to 8 gigabytes exactly. So this number should be 
8192. I don't know where it's going to put the spare space at the end, that's not a problem. And I'll apply that. It's okay. Now I'll just move that into at, to the end of the device so there's no space following it. Right, I've seen this before. So let's see if it actually works. Yeah, it has completed, that's okay. And then I'm going to lastly resize this partition, which is the main partition. So I'll just grow this this way. And you can see there's a little bit of space at the end that was the extra bit in the swap partition. Just grow that. So basically, there's another way of doing it. It's just type zero into both these boxes, the free space before and the free space after box. Click. Okay, yeah, it's just it's just warning you that uh, you might have software looking for this partition in a particular place. So you can see now that this has reconfigured the whole partition, uh, well, all partitions to use up the whole of the disk. So now let's press the go button and do that. And so this shouldn't take too long. There's not a lot of data to move and it's on the electronic disk, the solid state disk, so it should be relatively fast. Okay, that's done. So I'll just let it rescan the disk. It's done that, and yes, it looks okay to me. So what we can do, just as a final touch, is to check these. Check these two partitions. Um, can't check the swap because it's not a proper file system as such. And even if it was corrupt, it doesn't matter. We can just recreate the swap signature. But these two have got data on the structures we want to ensure. All right, what did it say about this? All right, okay. So, so either the partition is too small, or um, it doesn't like the fact that it's a FAT32. Um, but we can certainly do this one. Uh, option check yep that's okay let's have a look at the details and it seems to want to resize all oh, right it does the check in the middle by the looks of it yeah you can see it's all okay So that's that. Now, one problem we've now got is that, if you notice, we've got 
SDA1, the first partition is 1, that's fine. The second partition is now 3, not 2, and also the um, third partition is got a notation of 4 rather than 3. So we need to correct that. Now, I don't think there's an option in GPARTED to change this. Um, no, it doesn't look like there is. So what we can do is we can come out of this, get a prompt up. If I just change some options here to make it easier to see. Um, okay. So first thing I'm going to do is become the root. If I do F disk minus L on def SDA, which is the hard disk, um, it's not actually reported that some. Part oh right, yeah. Then yes, sometimes this comes up saying the partitions out of order. Well, they're not out of order. There's just a hole there. Um, so if we were to allocate another partition, if there was space, there isn't space now. Um, it would have SDA1, SDA3, SDA4, SDA2, and it would warn us that the partitions are out of order. So what we can do with this is to use GDisk on dev SDA. And if we press the question mark to get the menu up, there's an option here to... Um, I can't remember what it says now. Sort partitions, is it that one? Let's do a P for printing them. Right, this doesn't actually say what the partition designation is. Right, let me write that. I've done S to sort partitions. I think that was the option. So I'm going to write that partition. Do yes. Let's just check with um, F disk. Yes, that, that is the right option. I couldn't remember exactly what the option was. So you can see now we've got dev uh, SDA1 is the existing EFI partition. SDA2 now, instead of SDA3, if I scroll back, you see we had SDA3 as the second partition. And what was SDA4, which is a swap, is now SDA3. Now, of course, this now means that the um, partition information is incorrect in Grub and on the FS tab for the actual Linux system. So what we need to do is to mount our LFS system, SDA2, and we'll put it in the mount directory. And if we change into the mount directory, change into uh, boot, just check we are on, yes, we're on the Linux from scratch boot menu. It's always, always worth checking that you're not actually in the wrong boot menu and you're modifying your system or the live system menu. So now we can change into grub and there is the grub.cfg file. So if you do via grub.cfg or nano, whichever editor you want to use. Oh, we haven't got via here. Let's try and see if Finn works. Oh, okay, so it looks like I'm going to have to use nano. hope that's there. And we need to change the root is now not GPT-3, it will be GPT-2 because it's the second partition. So we'll change that. And we need to change the root here to SDA-2 because it's now 2 instead of 3. So that's fine. That should be sufficient. Uh, right, I'm trying to do a Vim save there. And here we do Control x Yes. Enter. So let's just cat that to make sure it has actually taken those changes. 
So yeah, we've got uh, GPT-2 there and SDA-2, so that's fine. So the next thing we need to modify is to go back oops, and then into the ETC directory and edit the FS tab um, config file. So straight away you can see the root partition, it was SDA3, we've got to change that to SDA2 and also the swap partition, it was SDA4, it's now SDA3 and that should be it. So if we now, oh, recording a macro, I don't want to do that. Save the buffer, yes, this is control X I've just done, save the buffer, yes. Right to file FS tab. Let's just cat that to make sure it's okay. And you can see we've got SDA2 is at EXT4. SDA, yeah, SDA1 is the existing EFI partition and SDA3 is the swap partition. Um, one other thing I think I'll do while I'm here is to mount the EFI partition. So mount dev SDA1 onto mount boot EFI. So what we're doing is we're mounting the EFI partition within our mounted LFS boot partition as it would do if we were booting it and in theory we could true root into this directory this mount directory because we've got a, if I do DFS H we've got our root partition plus the EFI directory mounted as if it were a, a normal boot so we could true, make, create a truth out of that go into the true environment and um, use that as if it were the real environment if I go into mount boot EFI, you can see there's the EFI directory. This is the Apple one that was there originally. And, all right, okay, I've already deleted that. Now, I expected to see um, an Apple directory there with the Apple firmware in it. Um, so, uh, I don't remember deleting that, actually. Maybe I deleted it on the last video, in the LFS video, as part of the um, part of the part where I was showing how to use the EFI boot manager to make LFS boot automatically after, after all the testing had been done. Where, if you watch the video, you'll remember I'd used EFI boot manager to make LFS boot on a one-shot mode where it would boot once, but the next reboot of the Apple Mac would uh, boot into the Apple Mac OS. Um, uh, and then when, once I knew the LFS system was working correctly, I then made the booting into LFS permanent. So I wondered if I'd actually, at that point, deleted the Apple directory. If you have got the Apple directory, you can delete it because it's not needed anymore. We haven't got an Apple partition. Um, yeah, there's no hidden files there. So there's one there, FS Events D. I don't know what that is exactly. Right, I'm not sure what they are. Um, I don't recognize them, so I imagine they are part of the Apple boot system. Um, whether they're still needed or not, I don't know, so I'm not actually going to delete them yet, but I will do. Maybe a binary file. Let's have a look. That makes no sense. I guess the other one's going to be the same. Yeah. So that's got a UUID number. So what 
was that number? It was CE4C. So that is probably the Apple partition. I can't see that UUID here anywhere. Um, let's try this. No. Yeah, I have a feeling that could probably be deleted um, without any effect. I'm not going to delete them. What I'll do offline uh, as not part of the video, I'm going to take a backup of the disk, uh, delete them, and see if it has any effect. And if it does, then I can restore the image um, and then I can let you know either way whether they can be deleted or not I mean they're not taking up any space to speak of it's only you know less than a couple of hundred bytes um, but it's just something there that maybe doesn't need to be there um, yeah you can't see it there so I don't think it it will be needed so yeah I shall let me make a note of that to check Right, okay. Um, so I think that is it then. We've done the grub config file. We've done the FS tab file. So there shouldn't be anything else need to do. So in theory, what I should be able to do now is to shut down the machine because I want to remove the USB stick. Um, if I reboot, I've got to make sure I remove a USB stick at the right time um, to ensure that the partitions on that USB stick don't affect the partitions as Grub sees them. So just to be safe, I'm going to shut down and power up uh, after I've taken the USB stick out. So let's do a shutdown. Um, I'm going to keep the live USB stick around just in case I can't work a way out to um, get the Beyond Linux and Scratch build going. You know, for example, I need to access an HTTPS site and I haven't got access to it. And I, you know, if there's some sort of uh, block, there's no sequence of events I can follow in the BLFS book to get to a point where I can start building, then what I will have to do is to come back into the live um, environment to use that to download the files that I need to get going. But at the moment, I'm going to take a chance and see if I can do that without pulling down any files.